thank you all for joining us. Uh, for those of you who I haven't met, which is most everyone, um, I'm Marilyn Lambert. I work here. I grew up here. Uh, we make maple syrup here. And uh, I'm also a nutritional therapy practitioner and kind of got into that and the, became introduced with the Weston Price Foundation years and years and years ago when you know you could just find it in a book and that makes me realize I forgot the Weston A. Price magazines tonight but most of you probably have seen them before and I'll bring them next time so you can leaf through them. Um, if you're not familiar, is everyone familiar with the Weston A. Price Foundation? Yeah. Nope, okay so for those not I'll give a little spiel because that's kind of what brings us together. Um, the Weston A. Price Foundation is founded off of Weston Price, who was a dentist back in the 30s. And he started to notice because, you know, during that was kind of the beginning of the Industrialized Revolution. And so there was more and more factory foods kind of coming into people's diets. And he was noticing that as people moved off the farms into the cities, there was more and more cavities in people's mouths. There was more and more disease in their bodies. Children were being born with smaller palates and more and more cavities uh, right off the bat. And he could even see a difference. I forgot my Weston Price book too, or I'd leaf through it and show you. There's a really great one out there, um, which shows pictures. He's got you know some older siblings that just have big, beautiful smiles and faces and they look so healthy. And then their younger sibling that was maybe born in the town, mom was much less nourished eating you know, just flour, you know, industrialized flours, oils, things like that. And so next sibling down or a few after um, had uh, an obviously more narrow face. Maybe their, their teeth are crowded, just not well. And he was noticing as a dentist too that as the health of people's mouths were very much reflected in the health of their bodies. So that made him more interested in his research and so he went to travel the whole world with his wife which in the 30s going to the far corner reaches of civilization was a bit of a feat more so even than it is now and uh, but that's what they did and he documented all of his research as he visited these different communities, civilizations, tribes that were completely untouched by modernization. And he saw that their bodies were healthy, their teeth were remarkable. They had, and beyond just the health of their bodies, um, they, you know, could have babies easily and healthfully. They lived well and strong and robust into old age. They had, their mental and emotional health was so great. Um, they were calm, they were happy, they were just amazing, like our epitome of good health, right? And he saw that that was from their diets that they ate. And so basically the um, nourishing traditions, which Sally um, Fallon, I don't know if y'all have seen this book, but it's like a coffee table book. It's like, I think it's the Bible of cookbooks. I don't so much necessarily follow the recipes because I mostly always cook the same thing and I admit if I follow a new recipe, it's because I saw a picture that looked good. <laughs> but uh, what's awesome about this book is that on every page, it could be in your bathroom, quite honestly, um, <laughs> because there's just fascinating blurbs about different people groups all around the world and what they ate to be healthy. So basically, there's no one perfect diet. You know, today, everything's in a box. You must be vegetarian, you must juice, you must be vegan, you must only eat meat, you must, you know, everybody's got their set of hardcore rules. And Weston Price basically was like, these people eat from place. And that kind of inroads into our topic tonight of traditional foods and how to prepare them. And really that idea of eating from place. Um, I read a study a little while ago I couldn't believe it's true, but I guess it is that somehow, um, what was it, F Kellogg's Frosted Mini Wheats or something topped the chart as being healthier than red meat, um, according, is that where it came from? Is, yeah. It looked legitimate, but I was like, I can't believe that this would be true, but there's a... There's a demonization of meat. You know, cows and animals are killing our environment and they're killing us as people. And that is just so not true. And I always love it, the fact that most of you know Melissa Tabor is here. And she, I get my milk from her. It's amazing. If you don't, you should. It's A2, A2, beautiful Jersey milk. It's got 
a nice lot of cream on it. Um, but her cows are outside in the sunshine. They're happy. They're eating grass and they're unstressed until, well, if she ever slaughters them. Same thing with her chickens. And they're just happy until the end. Um, and if you buy milk in the grocery store, chances are those cows never never get the sunshine on their back. There's even a couple large farms around here. Um, the cows are just in free stalls. They don't have the acreage and the manpower to pasture their cows. Um, we're fortunate enough to still have the dairy farm my mom grew up on just down the road. And uh, my uncle and cousin still run it. It's an organic dairy. Those cows are pastured. They're, it's an amazing thing. And you'd think that's what all dairy farms are like, right? Nope. So we have to get in this idea that we vote with our dollars, you know, and that eating from place. Um, so we support these farmers. Even if we pay more money for our milk, we pay more money for our meat. But on the other hand, we're not buying all this other stuff. I don't know how many times you guys probably go to grocery stores and you observe what is in people's carts. There's no food in there. There's no nutrition in there. Yes, maybe healthier food is more expensive, but one, it's at the expense of your investing in your health. And two, it might actually be cheaper depending on your grocery bill because you're not buying all of this stuff. I actually, um, pretty much this is show and tell. I brought you my kitchen. This is what I eat and not much more and not even all of this. Um, I've been predominantly mostly carnivore for the past three years. Uh, I've had Lyme disease, mold illness. Hi. Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, just been chronically ill, literally my entire life. Um, I've never known what it's like to be out of pain. Always had gut issues, always had so many issues. Um, I started to play the fiddle, but I was just telling Rachel this, started to play the fiddle when I was younger, but I can't, couldn't see to read music. My vision's fine, my eyesight's fine, but there's something messed up with my brain, so I couldn't see, have trouble reading. So many issues, and so many people today have issues, and it's just normal. It's normal to be labeled with a diagnosis. It's normal to have pharmaceutical medication. It's normal to not feel okay. It's normal for our kids to be, you know, mental health disasters and be constipated or this, or it's normal, but it's not, and we shouldn't accept that that's the norm. Um, and I didn't, and so it just sent me on a road of education, education, education. And I went all those places. I was on the macrobiotic diet for a long time, almost killed me, vegetarian, um, did all the juicing, just one thing after another after another until I finded, finally landed on meat. Why? Because, well, I don't know if you all have heard of Dr. Anthony Chafee. He loves to say, he's an Australian neurosurgeon and carnivore guy. I love his YouTube videos and podcasts if you ever get a chance to listen to him. But his tagline is plants are trying to kill you or plants want to kill you, something like that, which might be flabbergasting to some of you. Um, but I, it took me a long time to accept that. But really, it was the removal of everything except for meat products that uh, finally started to restore my body enough to lower inflammation and heal. And I had a bunch of great notes and stuff, but I'm just winging it. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> um, so that kind of has brought me where I am today as a nutritional therapist and Weston A. Price chapter leader, which they have these chapters I started to go there um, all over the world. Basically just groups that come together to share information and education on traditional diets, food preparation, to connect you with farmers, um, connect you with people like Melissa, connect you with your neighbors that are growing food the way food's meant to grow, that's restoring the land. Did you know an animal, a cow, that eats grass and then um, poops either in the barn or on the field, 80% of that nutrition plus is going back to the ground. Our soils are so depleted. Why? Because the cows are not living, growing, and dying on the land. The land needs cows. Um, it needs animals to thrive and to restore those nutrients. Industrialized farming today, and I love farming, and it took me a long time to ever say anything not totally positive about anything in agriculture, because I love agriculture, farming. That's how I grew up. But uh, 
industrialized far farming, monocropping, you know they're stripping the soil by planting the same crops over and over and over. They're putting chemicalized um, fertilizer on there, which is just killing the basically microbiome of the soil and depleting all the nutrients. And then nothing can grow unless it's specialized, chemicalized seeds done in their certain way. It's, it's destroying our earth. So if you care about the environment, if you care about your health, this is what you'll do <laughs> in a nutshell. Um, so I'm just going to go over basically what um, a few things are. And I've got some recipe handouts. This is going to be very um, informal. If I can just give you this and then just there's a top, there's two pages there. And ask questions, interact. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have been doing some of these things longer than I have. You've got skills to share. Interject, say, this is how I do it. Hi, Jess. Um, or what about this? Or I, have, I know nothing about a traditional food skills. What did you mean by that? So I know I'm doing all the talking right now and everyone's quiet, but please be interactive and speak up. Um, so we'll start with the sauerkraut. And I've got a jug of sauerkraut here. How many of y'all have had homemade sauerkraut before? Yeah, pretty good, right? This is actually last year's, so it's maybe lost a slight amount of its crisp. But for being over a year old of homemade sauerkraut, this is just the most amazing probiotic. You don't need to go to the store to buy a probiotic. Don't need to go to the store to buy a prebiotic. It's right here. Sauerkraut is one of the best probiotics that actually gets through your digestive systems. Most probiotics are a waste of money because you're, they just get killed in your stomach with your digestive ju juices before they can ever make a difference. That and the microbiome, as we studies and learn and we find that it's more and more important and crucial to our health, on the other hand, we don't really know anything about it. We don't, you know, you can test for different strains, but we don't really n understand it very well yet. But what we do know is looking back through history, because um, we kind of, it's like the smarter and more advanced our species becomes, the less healthy our species becomes. So maybe it's the best thing we can do is just look backwards. What well, always worked. Sauerkraut is amazing. Um, so y'all can have a little taste here. I forgot my forks around at the end if you want. Um, we'll delve in. But until then, I thought I'd just demonstrate how to make it. Has anyone ever made sauerkraut before? Yeah. Is anyone interested in making sauerkraut? <laughs> so this little cabbage came out of my garden. I picked a smaller one just because I didn't want to make like, oftentimes I'll just get a lot of sauerkraut and I've got like four pots going and what one thing you can do I do it all by hand with a knife um, you can do this what, what does everybody use food processor food processor, food processor food knife, and a mandolin okay knife mandolin food processor I am the only one doing it the ridiculously slow way <laughs> but uh it's it's I don't know the way I've always done it so I just cut everybody see this I usually just cut my cabbage in half I use red because it grows better in my garden. So I've grown, I started out with green and then I, it was great and fine. And then I added some red because it's pretty. And then suddenly like the Swedish, Swedish midge, I think it is, started to just destroy my green cabbage, but it never touched my red cabbage. So for the past three years, I've just grown red cabbage and it works. What, ca what color do you usually do? White, but I think, uh, you know, the red cabbage like we do in Germany. Yeah. yeah. Like steaming it a little bit, vinegar, and oh my god, that goes so good with this. Yeah, you're, you're the German background, so the cabbage queen right here. I'm just pretending I know about cabbage. She knows the cabbage. So I just slice it. I suppose a food processor would work so much better. But, and I use this knife for everything. Like I'm not a professional cook or anything, but I feel like you, you learn skills and then basically it all just plain boils down to what works for you, right? So here's my one knife that I pretty much use for everything. Works pretty well. And having a sharp knife. And having a sharp knife. 
Yes. And this one holds its edge pretty well. Yes. Yes. So tell me, how do you all make your, those of you who make sauerkraut, can you tell us how you do it? Okay. A little thinner? Yeah. Yep. Because you use a mandolin? No, with knife. Just with your knife. Okay. So a little bit thinner. All right. Versus like chunks. I think you're right. Yeah. You don't have to work as hard, right? You don't have to work as hard when you cut it smaller. Yeah. Then, then what do you do? Just add a little as you're doing now. Yeah. I layer it with the uh, you know hard salt. Yeah. Uh, sea salt, of course, you know what I mean, the dark horse sea salt. Like the Celtic sea salt? You got it. Yeah. Okay. Do that and, uh, you know, just gently massage. spray. Yep, just massage, massage it a little bit. And then when yep. I'm done, I just take the other end of a spoon or something, pound it. Yeah. And, and then you wait for that um, water because it will, you know, have yep, juice, juice out pretty juice, good. Juice yep. out, yep, for a bit. It lets out the juice for really nice. Yeah. And how long does that take for that to happen when you say let out? Wait. It depends on your cabbage. Okay. okay. What we call in Germany, you can find it at the uh, co-op, but it's called Spitzburg. It's like the pointy uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that is specific for sauerkraut. Oh. Because it's, if you pop open a red cabbage or mm -hmm. a regular green cabbage mm -hmm. and you do a, a pointy cabbage, I can't even remember what it's called here. <laughs> it just comes to mind, Spitzburg. Uh, there's, you know, a different form of the cabbage leaves inside. Mm -hmm. They're a lot looser, oh, not okay. so dense. Mm -hmm. And so that makes a whole difference if you're making it with those, is with the is it red. Like, natural, like they're more no, delicate? It's not that. No, no. Nap, nap is totally different. It's no, got a pointy it's head. Mm -hmm. But it's just it's not as like cold like or tender. tender. Exactly. It's not yeah. tender, but it doesn't have the leaves so compact. Okay. That's where it is now. They're not so compact. Exactly, and that wakes them up, you know, really good. A lot better. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, sometimes try one of those if you can find somebody in. Yeah. yeah. No, I've ne I never even knew that there was cabbage, like, specific for sauerkraut. Yeah, if you go to Europe. And, if you go to Europe where they know cabbage. <laughs> exactly. And, and uh, you know, you can just see acres and acres of that. And there's yeah. actually a festival just for that. Uh, cabbage. Okay. Yeah. Wow. You should be teaching this class. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I, just, I, I do it the rugged way. <laughs> <laughs> we all do. We all, we all find a way that works, right? Exactly. Yeah. It's yeah. good. So I don't know if you saw, I don't really, I don't um, measure the salt. I just dumped it in. Um, they say, I don't know, what do they say, like a tablespoon per head of cabbage or something? What do you all use? Does anybody actually measure? You don't measure? Go by taste, by yeah. what you've done. Yeah. And one time I did the cabbage with my sister-in-law, who's a very efficient person, and she used like a grinder, so it ground it really super, super fine. And then I just put this salt on, but I, I didn't have an eyeball frame because I'd never done it that fine before, and it was way too salty. Exactly. So it's like my eyeball frame was off. <laughs> it's because the salt was ground too fine. The okay. salt is supposed to be coarse. It's supposed to be coarse, yeah. Because the cabbage will break off, break up the salt yep. and create the juice. Yep. So it's not your fault. It's the mm. salt was too fine. Yeah. You can't handle mm. it. You can't do it with fine salt. Well, this is kind of in the middle. Yeah, yeah. Rachel. Marilyn, I have read a lot about cabbage and it's a, it's a very lowly vegetable, but it has wonderful properties, especially for fighting cancer. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Can you tell us, making it into sauerkraut, does yep. it enhance those qualities? Can mm -hmm. you speak to that? From what I understand, I don't know if it enhances them so much, because it's a, I, from my understanding, the biggest cancer-fighting effect of cabbage is it's a cruciferous vegetable, and it's a, um, that really helps with, I think it's your phase two liver detoxification. So it really helps remove toxins from the body, binds to them, removes them um, very well. From my understanding, that's like one of the best. Um, and also the red cabbage has, I think, more antioxidants in it. And so you get those effects plus the probiotics. And basically cancer is, um, um, 
what's that word? I want to say microbiotic, but that's the wrong word. Sorry, I lost it. Um, basically, your body's all out of balance. Who's got that word? It starts with an M. I lost it. Metabolic? <laughs> yes. Cancer is basically a metabolic disease. And so the, base, the beginning of metabolic disease is blood sugar imbalance and inflammation. And so if you have, and the basic of that is an imbalanced microbiome. And so the bad bugs basically, or even the good bugs, like we all have candida in our body, we all have H. pylori in our body, but it's the imbalance of those that leads to illness. Um, hi. <laughs> Millie is our official greeter. <laughs> and so with cabbage, if you are detoxing, so you're removing some those toxins that come into our contact with our light bodies every day, um, binding them through the digestive system and eliminating. If you're adding the probiotic benefit of the cabbage, then you're balancing out the good bacteria versus the negative. So therefore, you're lowering inflammation. I think that's a very rudimentary answer. It's probably a whole lot more to it than that. Is, do you know anything about the? I'm just going to throw this out because I know nothing about it. But like vitamin C. Is, yep. is there vitamin C in cabbage? Is that, because I know that that's part of some, some kind of cancer fighting ideas and, and yeah. that kind of stuff. But, I, there's a lot on vitamin C. I know that. There's like a whole book about it that I read one time, but it was years ago. I don't remember much about it. But yeah, vitamin C. Oh, there's so much to vitamin C. I, I don't know the vitamin C content of cabbage. I went, does anybody? I wouldn't be surprised if there is maybe some, because there's vitamin C, I think, in basically all. Hmm. The internet says that it is rich in vitamin C, fiber, and vitamin K. Okay. There, that's what we need. Love Google. Love Google. If you want a number, it's 8.4 milligrams per leaf of vitamin C. Of vitamin wow, C. That's, wow. cool. that's, that's a lot. lot. That's a yeah. lot. Really? Wow. Well, we can't always trust the internet. <laughs> you know, I feel like it's pretty good. I've literally been in doctor's offices while they Googled it before. <laughs> so I'm like, well, shoot, they use it Google, I get to. So I don't know if y'all can see this, but I'm starting to be able to wring the juice out of it. Isn't that cool? So if you do this long enough, you shouldn't have to actually add any brine to your cabbage because it just has its own juices that work its way out. And my cabbage, because I don't, I don't cut these. I'm a terrible lazy cook. I didn't cut the core out. I didn't cut enough of the bottom out. Usually, actually, if you weren't watching, I'd probably throw all that in. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> it's fine. It breaks down. It does. There's the right way to do it, and then there's the re way the rest of us do it, right? So then that's pretty juicy. I think I'm going to leave it. I don't know if, yeah, you can see it's really, and that didn't even take very long. And sometimes if you're doing a lot of cabbages, you know, I'll have maybe three or four pots going and I'll salt them actually in layers because this, that way the salt can get down through and the salt will start de like pulling the water out of the cabbage and then I'll just work them in kind of a circle and just work it for a little while and then work another one a little while and it just kind of allows it to continue to break down. What's the longest that you've kept any of your uh, this jar right here is just over a year old, and this is the long, usually it's gone by now. But this is my last jar of sauerkraut from last year. At times, I've eaten a lot of sauerkraut. Now, since I've been on a mostly carnivore diet, I don't. Sometimes I'll eat like the sauerkraut juices. Um, chickens love sauerkraut. My chickens won't eat cabbage, but they love sauerkraut. Go figure. So. What's that? <laughs> they know what's good for them, right? Yeah. Going back to the cancer thing, it's, uh, it's really important to know that cancer does not like acidic, or it it's, uh, loves acidic in your system. Mm -hmm. That's what fights the cancer. And the worst thing you can do is feeding it sugar. Yeah. You know, that's when I see people come out and they say, oh, they're really good, I got a candy bar today. I'm like, okay, that's not, that's the no no. It is. It is. I mean, we can do the same thing everybody's doing, and then we can be as sick as what everybody's doing. 
I'd rather not, thank you very much. I feel like I was starting from the, like under the bottom anyways, because I think for a while sometimes you can get away with it. You can get away with eating whatever you want. You can get away with, you know, even if you're just like, oh, I'll eat healthy, I'll hydrate, I'll exercise, I'm good. But at some point in your life, you come to the realization that it needs a little refinement, right? I started there at a very young age. It needed a little refinement. It just took me a long time to figure out what that looked like. Do you know Katie and Ben from the North Yeah, Park? yeah. She had the same issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's identical to what you just mentioned. You hear about yourself. I think a lot of people do. It's happy cricket. It's just we think it's normal. Yeah, look at all this beautiful juice. Introduction to this Western Press Foundation, which if you've heard of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the juice is just talking about you. Um, so sometimes if I don't do this enough because I'm lazy or I didn't cut my cabbage fine enough and there's not enough juice because you have to fully submerge the cabbage in the juice like that. This is a bit of a messy pro Sometimes I'll do this outdoors because it's kind of really nice and it's not let, you know, the mess is outside. So you want that juice to fully um, so be, have the cabbage submerged because otherwise you can get a little mold where the cabbage is not submerged under the juices. And I've done this, so this is right on the edge. I probably should have worked it just a little bit more. I might add just a little brine or I might just leave it like that. Right now I'm just going to leave it like that because it's mostly all submerged. And I started off, um, I'd take a cabbage leaf and just press it. Sorry, that. The sun's right there. right there. How's this? Right here? <laughs> then you've got the sun. Um, so I would use a cabbage leaf and press it down and leave it there. Um, for one year I used a plastic bag full of water and then I went all anti-plastic, but that worked. Now I bought these little glass weights, which I absolutely love. I would love one of those fermentation crocs, but I haven't bought one and I haven't found one used and so I don't have one. But these are pretty cheap. You get them on Amazon. And it holds the cabbage down perfectly. Yeah. I got a special big jar like that, and it came. The lid yeah. came with an airlock in the middle of it. Okay. So you put some water in there, and the, the you know, air can only go one way. Come out. Yeah. You know. And I know a lot of people use those, like fermentation lids. I never have just. I don't know. I don't buy stuff. I don't buy stuff. <laughs> I know. I know. And this always seems to hey, work. This, so. this makes it so easy. Well, I mean, one is though that it's isn't that kind of anaerobic? More? Yes, you want it. I mean, is it, is it? Oh, that's because better. Because it keeps yes. the water, yes. the you, air out. You want the you air out. The air. Okay. Yes. Okay. So that's why it's an airlock. But you also have to allow the air to escape because otherwise the gases will build up. And but I'm just thinking of those natural, so like the ceramic crocs don't seem to be particularly sealed in any way. If you look at those old. But it keeps like this is not sealed. But it keeps it submerged. So you want the, like the material submerged. How's anyone else submerge their cabbage? I use a pet rock. A pet rock. Okay. Yes, that would be the same idea. I never thought of a pet rock. Of course, that's the thing. Anybody else have any other way to submerge their cabbage? Yeah, plate. I usually yeah. cover it. I just make sure it's because that keeps the bugs out. Yeah. And it allows it to ferment. And it allows it to ferment. You get all those natural wild yeasts around your kitchen in the cabbage, and then I set it on a saucer because it will leak. Yeah, I love it. And it's my cabbage. It's my like because my sometimes your counters will be covered in your kitchen. There's a lot of potency going on. It does smell a little bit. Um, so then that just sits on your shelf and you'll come through and usually if it's really hot then it will ferment faster as you can imagine. If it's cool in your kitchen it will ferment less time. So if you run out of sauerkraut in January and you live in Vermont and your kitchen is like 60 degrees especially before you, sorry somebody's going to get the sun, <laughs> before you build a fire you know your cabbage could take, um, I've left it on the shelf a month before. Um, especially if you do it later in the fall, the kitchen's cold. So, so that's kind of it. There's nothing. There's no. There's no secondary phase. Like once I'm done. Okay. Boom. Okay. Okay. Great. Done. <laughs> and then I'll go back. I usually leave it for two weeks before I taste it. And then when it's you know softer and it just tastes good, then you put a cover on it, throw it in the fridge. Does that end up being rough, roughly? It's a couple. Sometimes it's two weeks. Sometimes it's a month. Anybody have any other? So a few, a few weeks. Yeah. Time? yeah, it could take. Yeah, two, two, two weeks. weeks. Yeah. yeah, and I've done um, different variations. Oftentimes I'll just do cabbage like that. Sometimes I've added caraway seeds, uh, fennel, 
um, cranberries that which looked like Christmas. It was really fun. Um, you can do ginger, little red pepper. Um, I wrote some options down in there. And of course, you've got Google, so you can find other fun things and just experiment. Yeah. I'm wondering the, the color, which is beautiful. Mm -hmm. Have you ever done shredded beets mixed in with it? Mm. I did. I did a shredded beet, and I think I put ginger in it too. And that was really good. And I did it with a green cabbage. I will have to find a white cabbage somewhere. That was really nice. Have you tried kimchi? Yes. Yeah. I didn't make kimchi this past year because I just found like, I don't know, you go through cycles. So yeah. it's like you see something. So I made some for a while. Um, I kind of make, I don't, I make my own. So I don't really add the fish sauce. I kind of do a Vermont garden variety. So it's just whatever I grow in my garden, Napa cabbage, carrots. Um, I just shredded carrots, leeks, things like that. What's the fundamental pepper. difference between sauerkraut and kimchi? What's no, kimchi, kimchi is hot. It's spicier. <laughs> you, the cabbage and vegetables are different. I mean, it's traditionally Asian. And it's yeah. Korean. And it has Korean. some gochujang yeah. stuff. Um, chili paste in it. Chili yeah. Paste, okay. And some yeah. Op anchovies. Fish, fish, uh, fish it's a little dip. It's mm -hmm. remarkably good. It's got the same probiotic idea benefits. Um, you'll find that almost all cultures have a semblance of fermented food, whether they're fermenting dairy, fermenting meat, fermenting vegetables. It's pre preservation. What's that? It's preserves the food. Yes, it preserves it. But the other added benefit, it's remarkably good for your gut. In fact, um, probably most of you heard of the GAPS diet with Dr. Natasha um, Big Bride and also Becky Plotner has written a, the different GAPS cookbooks. Um, but she just came out with a new one all about babies and it's brilliant. But her recommendation is the first 10 days of the baby's life, um, you feed it breast milk, obviously, because that's the very best thing you can do. Granted, you can do it. I understand not everybody can. Um, and you give the baby one drop of a fermented food, one drop in the morning and one drop in the evening, rotating for those first 10 days. And that sparks the baby's microbiome to be the most healthy building blocks from the very beginning. So like a drop of sauerkraut juice in the morning, a drop of um, uh, Kim, not kimchi, because that would be too spicy. Fear, but like, um, <laughs> beet kvass in the evening, a drop of, what's that probiotic fermented tea? Kefir? Kombucha. Kombucha, a drop of kombucha in the morning and a drop of, you know, something else in the evening for 10 days. I was like, can you imagine having a baby and starting off its life like that? Like, just setting that baby up to be fully healthy, physically, mentally, emotionally, like, wow, you yeah, know? It, it's even more important if they were cesarean, you know? It is. They don't go through the birth canal. Because you missed all that good inoculation. Yep, yep, but we all can start anywhere, right where we're at, right? Best thing you can do, remove the toxic substances and load in all these good ones. So I've just made a beautiful mess here. Um, any other? Thoughts, questions, comments on sauerkraut? Yeah. Well, this is going to sound pretty silly, but sauerkraut has never passed these lips. Ooh! Oh. Do you want to try some of my oh. sauerkraut tonight, Rachel? <laughs> <laughs> Would you grace me? <laughs> I'm sorry, or you're going to leave at seven before that. <laughs> I am, but do any of you people have any ideas on how to start? Oh, a good hot dog. Oh, a, a, yeah. a, little, a little bit on hot That's dog. That's a really good question. Yeah. It, My mother says on a hot dog. No, a Reuben. What, on a Reuben. 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 Oh, do a Reuben. Good. Really good. On a Reuben. Just beside grilled meat, just a little, yes, just just a little spoonful. Yeah. Yep. Or, or you could try just a little. Yeah. 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 She's going to regret Bottoms having made up. that admission. I think. Here you go, Rachel. Go, Rachel. Here you go. go. Rachel. There's the juice. Oh, You're on the spotlight now. What it's juice? It's just the juice <laughs> of sauerkraut. Of sauerkraut. Give it a little just cabbage sip. juice. Basically, yeah. it's old. Yeah. It's old. But it's old cabbage. <laughs> oh, 
It's all about your perspective. <laughs> You're okay. It's gonna make your gut bugs sing happy songs. Is it? Is oh it, yeah, they're gonna dance for joy. Okay, guys down there. Um, hold your, hold your nose. <laughs> while I'm anticipating this, um, this lady mentioned about that we needed to keep our bodies acid rather than alkaline. Mm -hmm. And this is a local person, and I'm sure most of you have heard of him, but he's no longer with us. But he wrote the book called. From folk medicine, and that's Dr. Ooh. Jarvis. Okay. Brilliant. Yes. Oh. And uh, honey, vinegar, apple cider vinegar. That was the vinegar, first medical book I ever read. Vinegar, okay. but apple cider yeah. vinegar and water in order. So it's another approach to keeping your body mm -hmm. on that acid side. I think yeah. she's so avoiding. If I talk long enough, I can just. Get <laughs> <laughs> she just called you out before you knew it. <laughs> we know the truth. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a little that. deaf in She's this just distracting yeah. you. <laughs> just the water that, that was just water from the cabbage. You didn't add water no. to that. Nope. No, no, no. And you can add, like, I just use tap water. Everything you read says don't use tap water, but I think that's because... Oh, wait, so you did add water. No, I not didn't. You didn't. But okay. if I, I had not had worked to. the cabbage enough, uh -huh. um, then it wouldn't have produced enough juice to be able to fully submerge the cabbage in the liquid. So I would add a brine, which I usually will mix up like a tablespoon of salt in maybe a pint of water and just top it off a little bit. Okay. Mm -hmm. You can do that. I wrote that in your notes. But if you work the cabbage enough, um, you shouldn't have to you shouldn't have add to. any brine at all. But if you do have to add water, just don't add fluor fluoridated yeah. Chlorine tap water. So you have like a refrigerator full of. Uh, I kind of uh, do. I, I so thought about taking a picture of my fridge and literally bringing it in. <laughs> you never it process in. it then. Uh uh. No. Is so that you, a have bad you ever thing? done that? Yeah. Like, yeah. So you can it. Right. Can okay. it. Okay. Does. And then, would that, and then that because it's heated would that like could you cook I don't it know. then I would imagine that would kill off some of the well, good that's bacteria what I'm wondering. it's not raw any longer huh. I, I don't know, know. The real, I mean part of the interest to me is when I bought some sauerkraut yeah. once and it was like seven dollars <laughs> I was like how can this be seven dollars for a jar of cabbage which is super cheap so yeah. that kind of got me thinking and it did I'm not sure whether it said it was pasteurized but it definitely had the you know it was sealed. Definitely sealed. sealed. Most of them are pasteurized, sealed. which is yeah, why you don't want to buy sauerkraut no. from the no. store because it's no. the bugs have been killed. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The sauerkraut pro yeah. over here should be killed. Okay. Yeah. There's yeah. so many of them on Philly's farm and market who makes their own organic sauerkraut and kimchi. Yep. And yeah. she doesn't pasteurize it. Yep. Mm. You can find local people who do it, and it's phenomenal. I don't know if I've had hers, but I've had somebody that makes it locally. I can't think of the no, name. Flat so family so farm makes it. Yeah, yeah that's where delicious. Okay. okay. Yeah. 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 But also, I think, you know, you might get that air unlock when you take yeah. open the jar because it's fermenting. It's still it's alive. Fermenting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That could so be as well. Yeah. I'm really I'm sorry about, about this. Sun. I need to get a curtain. <laughs> if, if I hard, thought about it before, box. I would have. <laughs> there are five more big people. <laughs> <laughs> also, there's, there's a Bubby's brand. Bubby's brand. Yeah, that's, I think that's what I purchased. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was not pressurized. But it's always it's not good to make your own. Um, one thing, I don't, when I was a kid, I loved to cook and I made pie. So much pie. Um, and then I stopped baking, and I lost my joy of cooking. No more pie. Um, all my brothers cried. No, because um, there was no more pie. But uh, I've slowly found, like, reconnected with the joy of making things with my hands, slowly, methodically, appreciating the fact that I grew this, you know, what it's going to do for my body. And I think there's therapy that we have lost in our kitchens from connecting with our foods, connecting with our environment, connecting with friends. I love to make food for people. I found my sister this magnetic like bumper sticker type sticker. I gave it to her for Christmas. She said, I love people, I make them food. It's like, yes, I love people, I make them food. Cause she does the same thing. Uh, she feeds the whole neighborhood. My mother, we grew up, there were always people in our house eating food. We kind of lost that today. One of these days I'd love to have a potluck and everybody can just come and eat food, right? Doesn't that sound fun? But yeah, um, should we move on from sauerkraut? Yeah. All right, okay. Kind of Sticking with the fermented theme. Just try it outside. <laughs> Oh, did she try it? Poor Rachel. I shouldn't. I shouldn't have put her on the spot. I shouldn't have put her on the spot. Poor Rachel. <laughs> Has anyone ever made vinegar before? Yes. 
Tell me about your vinegar making. Yeah. It's, it's apple cider in the purest, most delicious. Cider. So easy. Do you know what I made this beautiful, gorgeous oh. vinegar out of that y'all can try? Mm -hmm. Milkweed blossoms. Oh, it's it's the most beautiful thing. thing. Wow. I went and picked a bunch of milkweed blossoms. It was there were a ton of them, so I did not starve any monarch butterflies. <laughs> no worries. Um, there's this book that I got that I thought I was going to absolutely love. Um, Homebrewed vinegar. Anyone ever seen anything by this person? She makes a lot. She also has another one of fermented vegetables, which I love that one a lot. Um, but this one, the reason why I didn't end up loving it is because she uses a lot of starters. Um, so she uses like a starter yeast and a starter this and a starter that. And I love to make vinegar from just wild things. So the wild, I guess you call it wild fermentation, which there's a book by that, but I. Don't buy every book I want to buy <laughs> yet. Um, so this, I just filled a half gallon. I don't have, yeah, I guess just one of these. Um, I just filled a half gallon jar, about two thirds full with milkweed blossoms. I didn't wash them. I kind of shook the bugs out of them crawling on my counter. Um, they're beautiful. I just love milkweed blossoms. They're gorgeous. So I filled about two thirds full. I put in a cup of, I used maple sugar, but you could also use like organic cane sugar, raw cane sugar. Uh, and then I just left it on my counter and shook it up because the shaking it, um, I didn't do anything to submerge the flowers underneath the water so they would have grown a little mold, which some mold on fermented things is not bad for you. I know on dairy, if your, fer if your mold is pink or orange, throw it away, that's bad. But overall, when you're fermenting things, a little mold doesn't hurt anybody. But uh, I just shook it about three times a day. That kept all the bacteria moving and uh, didn't get any mold. And after, I didn't time it. I'm guessing maybe it's just under two weeks, but over a week, somewhere in there. It tasted really good and fermented. It kind of got past its alcohol sugar process. And uh, this gorgeous stuff was the result. I have about three more of these at home, and it's so good. Um, yeah. So no water, just the... Mm, uh, oh, I'm sorry. And then I submerged it with oh, water. Okay. Yep. Okay. I filled it till um, like an inch from the top. Yep. Good question. And then I just let it sit, and then I just um, filtered out the flowers. Mm -hmm. And then this will just store like indefinitely, just like this, in a cupboard. And I love a little vinegar um, in my seltzer water. Yeah, just a, it just gives it a little oomph. Yeah, um, love it. And my mother likes to make switchel. Um, so she'll add a little maple syrup with, well, yeah, vinegar, lemon, and water. Is that how you make it? Ginger. Ginger, Ginger yep, a little vinegar. So I just think it's fun to play around with different vinegars. Um, so y'all can try this one. You know, there's no fruit flies at my house, but I bring this up here and all of a sudden there's fruit flies. Um, so this is a blackberry vinegar that I've kind of got going. So I picked a bunch of blackberries. I filled the jar about two thirds full and then covered them with water. And then they, there's a little bit of smuts on top, but it's fine. Um, and then to make it stronger, I emptied those blackberries out, squeezed them, in, squeezed them in a cheesecloth to get the juice out, gave that pulp to my chickens. And uh, then I filled it again with about two thirds of freshly picked blackberries just to make the end result a little stronger. And I think it's almost getting there. It's all nice. You can look at this, but it's all nice and bubbly on top. It's beautiful. No sugar in this at all. Just the sugar in the berries and the wild yeast on the berries and that's it. And it's a beautiful vinegar. And some people were like, what? Why do you need so much vinegar? Uh, <laughs> because it's just, I find the more you find something that you like to make, the more you find uses for it. I don't really eat salad, but I just, I don't know. And sometimes you just take a little swig. I love it in seltzer water. I think that's my big thing. And sometimes I'll put it in like on meats. You know, you get that, what's that fat, salt, acid, fat, heat, what was like the combination? Yeah, the chefs and are shaking their heads. Yeah, so you get that combination. So we have little cups, y'all can try this. Um, these are some carrots that I have fermenting here. This lid is not on, so it can kind of breathe. And I just did, I love these. Um, 
I just do carrots. I threw some dill in there and I threw some garlic. Um, I had some garlic scapes that I just kind of went to seed. So they've got those beautiful little garlic pearls. Mm -hmm. And so I cut the outside off and threw those in. Um, and just water and salt. Um, so I did like a brine um, and shook it up, stirred it really good so the um, salt melted in, um, dissolved, there we go, and then just topped them off. And there's a little glass lip on here, so that kind of keeps all the material under the liquid. And within one day, it was all bubbling nicely. So I'll again leave that on the counter until I think it tastes right, and then I'll put it in the fridge. And, so, and another probiotic, beautiful veggie. So good. Uh, does anybody ferment any vegetables? I'll go, I'll come over here. Oh yeah, I did. Yeah, Jess. Well, I just had a question about the vinegar. Can it go too far? Like nope. if you leave it too long, like if you leave the berries in there for like, and then if so you forget if you to shake the it, stuff yeah, the it, stuff in it. I'm going to say, I don't ha have experience with that purse. Well, actually, yes, I did. I did leave something in too long. It got moldy on the top. Yeah, so like if you're not on top of the shaking. Uh -huh. And then I yeah. threw that away. Yeah. Because I don't know. I think it seems like, and correct me if anyone has another opinion, most of those natural molds are pretty harmless as long as they're not like dairy, orange, or pink molds. Mm. Anybody else afraid of a little fish will mold? No. We grew up and we I've cut that part more. off and mm -hmm. mom ate that and then we ate the good part, right? <laughs> yeah, just it, like, Mom's still here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just had to contaminate the taste more than anything. Is like my kind of issue. Yeah. That, like I had a really bad I've had a I've had so many failed fermentation experiments. <laughs> and I think a lot of it yeah. for me is maybe I don't keep up with the like submerging or yeah. the shaking or this or that. Yeah. Um, I think so because yeah. I've had I've been doing this since I well before I could drive, experimenting with stuff. And I've had a lot of fail I just gave up on like way fermented anything because that yeah. just never turned out well for me. The yeah, lacto fermented, I don't right. know. And different things. And I don't know, you just find out what works. I've yeah. thrown away, I threw away one batch of vinegar because it was too moldy. I wasn't sure it tasted, I didn't like the flavor. Right. Mm -hmm. So I pitched it. And it's nothing lost. It's water and material. Yeah, right. That you came by. First. It's just disheartening when it happens again <laughs> yeah, and again. Really, really. I know. Yeah, you're I looking, you're looking forward to this product. Keeping it yeah. submerged yeah. Uh -huh. and shook it up. Yeah. Um, the berries, I'm, I'm not shaking so much, but I press them down with a spoon every day. And that, I think, keeps too much mold colonization on the top. Mm -hmm. Does that sound good? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Does temperature affect it too, probably? I just do room temperature. Room temperature, yeah. Yeah, and I only made vinegar this time of year, so, uh -huh. I mean, it's been chilly the last few nights. Mm -hmm. Then yeah. it gets warm again. Right. And that's my house. <laughs> and that's what people <laughs> had throughout history. That's what they had throughout yeah. history. So it's not, it's not like, it was like a, a temperature, temperature controlled, controlled environment. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Good question. Mm -hmm. I just try to keep it submerged. Uh -huh. Yeah. Go with that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A couple of years ago, I had a garden, but you know, like a community garden. Mm -hmm. um, I grew tomatoes, and someone gave me this flat of I had a whole row of these great tomatoes, mm -hmm. and they grew up, and I, you know, staked them and everything, right? And they, and they, they, you know, produce a lot of tomatoes. They were great. Yeah. They never ripened. I think mm -hmm. never, never, never ripened. Didn't wrap them a up few would just would rot, and it's like, wait a minute, I'm not going to let this go to waste. Mm -hmm. So I just picked them green and I um, fermented them. Mm -hmm. and they Why not? Really well. Yeah, they're fine. Like yeah. a salsa type, or just what do you use them? Just a salt. Okay. Yeah, just salt. And ate them that way. Yeah, I, I think mean, that's but brilliant. Let them ferment, though, you know. Yeah. You turn it to pickled tomatoes. <laughs> okay. You can just do it. Just water whatever. and salt, like just on yeah. the counter? Uh -huh. Okay. Mm. And yeah, then you just idea. refrigerated them? Or you, yep. yep, refrigerated. After the fact. Mm -hmm. Love that. I don't want it to go to waste. Nothing goes to waste, right? Exactly. Brilliant. My grandmother would have turned that into relish. Sweet hot dog relish. Yeah. Yeah. All her green tomatoes. Yeah. Anything else on vinegar, fermented vegetables? All right, moving right along. Anyone enjoy kefir? Yes. So if you need a good milk source, Tabor Ranch. <laughs> Melissa can hook you up. Um, so I've been making um, kefir for quite a while. My favorite way to use it is 
I love to take the kefir grains and make sour cream. Um, anybody ever made sour cream out of kefir? Uh, it's my new like first love, favorite, most recent. Um, you can have a taste of this as well. You, it's so sweet, you could put it on berries instead of whipped cream. It's amazing. Basically, I just got the milk. I think I, most recent batch, I did three, three uh, half gallons worth. And because you're taking, I mean, your, your milk should be full fat because your body needs that fat. But I figure when I skim that off and I'm using it and then I'm fermenting the rest, um, it's still a win-win, I think. Um, so I would, I'd skim the cream off and then just add the kefir greens, grains and leave it on the counter until it turns nice and thick. And it's just, you'll have to try it. You're going to fall Where in love too. I don't know. <laughs> I uh, obtained some a long time ago. <laughs> I don't remember. Um, I meant to bring them tonight. I think I'll probably have a little bit I can give to somebody. Melissa has some for sale. Yeah, Melissa has a good amount for sale. They just keep regenerating. And so I obtained some from somebody years ago. And you can freeze them, right? You can dehydrate them, though I've never done that. Or you can just keep making a lot of kefir. Um, it piles up fast. So I've got some kefir cheese, soft cheese over here. Everyone can try. I should have left all this covered up. Um, but I'll cover that back up now. Um, so that's carrots and cucumbers that I grew and just some soft kefir cheese. It's like cream cheese and I just added salt and I'll, I'll tell you how to make that in a minute. Added salt, dill, and a little red pepper. I hope I didn't get too heavy handed with red pepper. Yes, mom? So you know, we're all um, finding things that work for us. Um, you plant your garden, you all plant gardens probably, right? And you think everything as you're flipping through the seed catalog or the rack at the store, you're like, that's cool and that's cool and that's cool. And then you grow it all or you grow some things and it doesn't work out. And you just find yourself gravitating towards using or preserving some things more than others. So as years go by, you kind of hone and refine and just grow what works for you. I think the same thing with kitchen tools. This is my favorite bowl in the whole world. <laughs> this silly plastic bowl that I use for everything, whether I'm picking beans or making kefir. So kefir, um, you want to use full fat, raw milk, always, always, always full fat always raw if you can find it. Around here we are so privileged by so many raw milk sources. I have a brother in Indiana and he's having a terrible time finding raw milk and he found a source like two hours away for like $25 a gallon or some crazy thing. So we're privileged that we have such access um, to raw milk. And they have laws that they can't go, they cannot go over the state line. Yeah. Yeah, or it can only be labeled cat food or something. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yep. Because what has helped us be alive and well for thousands of years is all of a sudden going to kill us. Um, I mean, granted, you want to know where it comes from. I grew up milking cows as a kid. Bacteria can, you know, get in the milk. But if you know where it's coming from and your farmer does a really good, clean job, then it's safe as could be. Right, Melissa? Absolutely. Right. Um, so you want to use just plastic glass wood. You don't want your metal to come in contact with your kefir. Does anyone know why? I don't either, but something changes, <laughs> something changes it. I don't know either. You could Google that one. <laughs> um, so this is my fermentating cap. I always use organic cheesecloth. Um, I think the more you can eliminate chemicals in your environment, only the better, right? We're going to such great lengths to input good food into our bodies. Um, why would we wear polyester and put non-organic cheesecloth anywhere near anything? I mean, we all do what we can. We make little stabs here, there, and everywhere. This is one of my little stabs, organic cheesecloth. Um, and just a, so this, this kefir has been sitting on my counter for 
I think two days. I usually do two days. Um, does anybody else do a different length of time? How long do you ferment your kefir? Um, 24 hours. 24 hours, okay. And then, so I don't know why originally this was such a difficult concept for me, so that's why I wanted to bring it to show you. Because um, I just read about it and for some reason it took me a little trial and error to figure out how to strain my kefir. Um, so first of all, troubleshooting, this is just the beautiful cream on top. That's like, one time I went to Melissa's and I got a jar of milk and the cream was literally down here and I felt like it was Christmas. I did like a happy dance with my jar all the way to my car. <laughs> like, that's Christmas cream right there. Um, so that's beautiful. Sometimes if you ferment, so one of the most common um, things is to ferment your kefir too long so you'll get a greater separation of whey and solids. There's nothing wrong with that. Shake it back together. I have found that if you use milk that's a couple days old, you will have a stronger um, like grassy flavor to the kefir. If you fermented longer, it will have also a stronger, little bit more sour flavor, but it's not bad. It's just a stronger flavor. If you don't like it, feed it to your chickens. Um, after you shower, put it on your body. Like probiotic body products are all the rage these days. Just use your kefir, it's the best. Um, for that microbiome, external, internal. Um, so I just, I have a little smuts on my filter. I just have a plastic sieve that I have, and then I just pour my kefir through. This has been sitting out at room temperatures for a couple hours now, oh, so sour. it's it's a little runnier. Yeah, sour milk. Attractive. What's and the quantities, the quantities of. You haven't figured out I don't measure anything yet? <laughs> so I just have kefir grains, and some people's kefir grains really multiply. Does anyone make kefir and their grains really multiply? Okay, I don't make it very long, and then if I ferment it, but I don't want to deal with it, I'll just put it in the fridge, which will really slow the fermentation process, or if I don't want to go get milk, or if I have too much kefir. I just might not strain it. I'll throw it in the fridge for a couple days, and then I'll just do this, this exact process. I never split my kefir grains. Um, I probably could give away some tonight. I have a baggie at home I was bringing up for that purpose. I have found that when I make sour cream, my kefir grains um, multiply a lot faster for some reason. There's like more sugars in the cream or something, so they just multiply a lot faster. Um, but this is my exact process. I just go round and round and I never change it. Yeah, um, I noticed when I put it outside in the sunshine, it seems to ferment faster, so I don't do that anymore. <laughs> um, I'm sure there's more cream to it, but I haven't, mostly though, I just do like two days. So like Melissa does 24 hours, I do about 48. Um, really thick like to it to get it to come out of okay and that's usually this is sometimes a little thicker than this but I don't know not always I like it thick like that so my favorite way to use kefir is I'll take three eggs separate the yolks from the white feed the white to my dog and it makes her coat really soft and shiny and uh, then I'll beat up the yolks in a pint jar add some kefir about a cup of kefir so it's about a you know, half pint, a little bit more. Add a little bit of vanilla and sometimes a, just a sprinkle of nutmeg and then stir it all around. And then that's my eggnog. And I kind of cycle through. I'll have it every day for a few weeks and then take a break and have it again. But especially if I haven't had it for a while, um, I drink it and I feel like the light bulb's just turned on. Like, whoo! Like my body needed that cholesterol, the choline, you know, the B vitamins that are just so rich in that egg yolk and, you know, mixed with the probiotics and the available calcium um, in, and vitamin D, vitamin K in kefir, that's like powerhouse right there. You want a protein shake? There's your protein shake. So here's my kefir grains. 
right here. And I actually, maybe I can take some of these out and put them. I don't have anything. Yeah, I got all those little cups over. And then I'll add this to somebody's and somebody can take some of this grains home. That will work. Melissa, do you, how much grains do you usually add to your kefir? Like a big tablespoon. Okay. So I have like that much left over. That's about half. So I just transport these back in here, which my jar is all still nice and inoculated um, with kefir. I don't make yogurt because I think it's too much work. Um, does anybody make yogurt? Yeah, Laura makes yogurt. You make yogurt. Melissa makes yogurt. But you have to like have a temperature controlled thing. I don't have a thing. Um, so I just make kefir, which it's got. Heat the oven and then turn it off and put it in overnight. Yeah, that's a good idea. I would probably burn it. It's a little fussy. Yeah, so I just do kefir anyways. I just do kefir because it's like really good for you. You ask me all the mystery questions. Yeah. <laughs> What's it made out of? I don't know. Yeah. 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 And then they continue to grow and get separated. So I just separated these, so it's probably enough for like two people. And what you do of the yogurt. So I don't know what key. Oh, she's good. You're gonna tell us what are kefir grains. So basically, we're all kitchen chemists <laughs> that are doing amazing things. How big are those jars? These are half gallon jars. Yep, half gallon jars. I got my little bit of kefir in there. Oh, you okay? I do a whole half gallon. I don't know why, except for I get my milk from Melissa in half gallon, and it's just it's like we streamline, right? I am the most streamlined cook. There is like no wasted mm -hmm. effort stuff. I don't know. This so, is what I do. So the sour cream you made, that's just cream with the kefir chocolate? Yes, you must try it. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be your new thing. Yeah. yeah. So then I just pour in the milk after I've shaken it. So the cream is all mixed back in. So there's my new kefir. And I just set that, there's my fermenting cap and I just set that on the corner of my counter for two days and it's literally as easy as that. Um, like Melissa said it will sometimes be more thick so I didn't really have to use my wooden spoon to kind of stir the kefir down through the sieve. Sometimes you do um, but that's amazing. Any ideas, thoughts, comments on kefir? Okay, should we pass it around at this moment? So, have you ever second fermented your kefir? No, tell me about that. You can add, so once it's done, you can add fruit to it? Yes, I've read about that. And it will give it flavor. Okay, versus like putting it in a blender and blenderizing fruit into a smoothie or something. Yep. You can add, you add it. Yeah, ferment it. Okay, and then you would just leave this on your counter for another day. Yep. Okay. Okay. I like that. Does everybody want to try this right now? Okay. We'll see if. Yeah. You want to do that, Melissa? You're so great. Thank you. And you can add, like, if this is too much, just sourness, you can add some maple syrup or a little maple syrup and vanilla. It's so good. I don't eat maple syrup. I make a lot of it, but <laughs> don't tell my mother that I don't eat what I make. No, it's really good. The syrup's really good. I had a Russian piano teacher growing up, and she used to give me goat's milk kefir. Yes. Like a reward when I was like playing. Yes. Oh, that's brilliant. 
I took some of Laura's um, goat milk and made kefir out of it. And her girls don't really like the cow's milk kefir. They don't like this. But they really liked the, didn't they like the goat milk? Somehow it was sweeter. They liked it better. And if you're not in love with the taste, just think about it as an elixir shot. It's but good you for you. There's a little tingle in there, right? It's tangy. Whoops, that's a good sized one. And I, I don't really drink this straight. Like I said, I add it with the egg yolks, which I think tempers it a little bit. And then the vanilla. Is this good? Okay, thank you. Got a few more, okay. <laughs> Keep going. So how's that taste compared to kefir you may have made or had before? Is it delicious? You could only ferment it 24 hours instead of two days, and that would probably make it less tangy. Okay. And then what I do is I just pour it right back in the fresh milk jar. You can tell I don't like doing dishes, right? <laughs> do I ever wash anything? Yes. <laughs> so I only take the cream off if I'm making the sour cream. So if I'm making the sour cream, I'll take the cream off. Otherwise, uh-huh. Okay. And then I'll just use the milk okay. and I'll make kefir out of that. This, you just put everything yep, exactly. And if I want to make kefir cheese, um, I will actually set this in my sieve. Um, this, you can tell this is well used and loved because um, I use it until I can't really use it anymore. And this is slightly on the small side, um, but I can fit a whole batch of kefir in here and I'll set it over the sieve and then just tie up the corners and hang it over a bowl. And I have um, a wooden shelf in my kitchen that's set on like those metal bracket, shelf brackets, and I'll actually wedge the spoon through and then hang a coffee mug on the other end of the spoon with a rubber band. <laughs> You can do anything from anything, right? That's the beauty of it. I'd love to see your all's kitchens and processes sometime. <laughs> That's mine. Um, and so the whey just drips out. You can use that whey for cooking. It will just enrich any baked things that you make. Um, you put it in mashed potatoes, any other uses for whey. Have you ever used that in your fermentation process to get it a jump start? I haven't recently, yeah. but you, that, you could because that would work really well. Yeah, um, I typically feed it to my chickens because they love it. And I figure it's coming back in just eggs, so we're good, right? Um, yeah, so that's, that's the kefir. This is the sour cream. Um, it's kind of a little thick. Does everybody want to try a little shot? Okay, we'll try this next. Bring it. I think we can do this in shots. It might pour enough. Or I might have to spoon it. Here, I'm going to spoon it. Give, every, give everybody a spoon and pass it around. Can I get behind you real quick. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Very sorry to use plastic spoons. I did have ones I was bringing from home, but I forgot them. Um, so what should I do? Is pass this around, sure. just like this? Just with one spoon. Just one spoon, and you can ladle. Do you think that'll work? Or do you want to use these smaller ones? All right. What's everybody think? Can you reuse your keeper cups, or you want a little one? Because I can do little ones. All right. Go to town. Okay. Does, would anyone like a spoon yourselves? No? You all are a very environmentally conserving group. That will change your life. 
Put that on a baked potato. Put it on any of your vegetables. Just eat it. I eat it straight because um, I don't eat a lot more than, I don't eat a lot of dairy, but a lot more dairy and meat. Yeah, great with berries. What were you going to say? Oh, you can't wait till it gets around to you. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> it's so good. And then the kefir cheese. Um, and you, got, you can do a lot more with it. This is just like a soft cheese. This would be like your, your ranch dip, you know, if you got sour cream. And I just put some fresh dill and red pepper and salt. You could do garlic. You could do thyme, rosemary, um, any combination of anything in here. But you're welcome to try this, if you like, with vegetables um, as a little dip. Whoops. Do we need some more cups? Yeah. Thanks, Mom. And that's really nice. And then as far as you, other uses for kefir, um, Melissa actually, because she's a cheese maker, and she uses it. She's going to teach us all a cheese making class. Um, I know. No one can wait. Um, but you actually use the kefir as a starter for your cheese. Yeah, which is brilliant which is brilliant. Um, but you can also use, make it like a cream cheese spread. Um, and I find that the more you have something, the more you, what do you think? What do you yeah. think? Yeah. You're never going to buy store-bought sour cream again, are you? This was the thing that got us through the pandemic. We have, we sour cream? I love that. Sour cream makes, it just elevates everything, right? It just elevates everything. Yes, yes, I agree. Um, any thoughts, ideas, comments on kefir? Fermenting so milk. Have some to sell at your place. I have some grains. Yep. Yeah. yep, and I have some. There's live grains and then there's like. I don't know where they just went. A dried powder. Oh, no. I had some in a little cup, but the little cup disappeared. This is going from interesting to interesting. Do not know where the little cup went. <laughs> Maybe we'll find it. Maybe we'll find it. Uh, yeah, Melissa has kefir grains. Um, yep, available. Let's see. So really, um, you cannot get, if you're concerned about gut health at all, and the thing with kefir is that the, the lactose, which is what a lot of people are sensitive to, is removed. It's all eaten up. Um, so th it's lactose free. Also, um, the A2, A2 milk is significantly more easy to digest and absorb, and it doesn't bother people that have dairy um, sensitivities. Also, eating kefir has been known to um, heal people from candida overgrowth. So you don't often know if you have candida, but if you have dry skin, if you have any type of psoriasis, eczema, dandruff, um, yeast infections, you've got candida overgrowth. Uh, oftentimes it goes with depression and um, inflammation as well. You've got candida overgrowth. Usually if you just, if you eat too much um, sugars and starches, carbohydrates for you again that your neighbor could be like why are they so healthy and they eat and do whatever they please we are not all created equal <laughs> we are born with a bucket of a certain size and when yours gets filled up uh symptoms spill out sorry it's what you got that'll kill off the good too yes antibiotics are not your friend unless they're going to save your life yeah yep Exactly, exactly. Um, so antibiotics are in there too. So uh, kefir will, will kill off candida overgrowth. Um, it will actually heal, sometimes heal a lactose or milk intolerance or allergy. Again, you always want to try these things in just a, like a little bit, a teaspoonful for a, every day for a week to make sure you have no reaction. So um, don't take what I'm saying to the bank as medical advice. You always want to try, because I'm just a nutritionist anyways. Um, but you always want to try it and be smart about it. Don't just be like, oh, this is going to cure me. It's like, we'll start small. Patch test, right? Um, so that's all the fermentation things. 
I, let's see, so bone broth is something else I wanted to go over. Bone broth is like the staple to life. What, there was a South African proverb, which I had written down because I thought it was so amazing. But uh, a South American proverb, a good broth can resurrect the dead. <laughs> is that not amazing? A good broth can resurrect the dead. And uh, back in the 12th century, broth was known as Jewish penicillin because they used it so much and cured people of so many things. Um, if you're familiar with the GAPS diet, which a lot of you are, broth stock is the foundation of that whole protocol. Um, so there's a difference between broth and stock. Is anyone familiar, heard those different terms? So bone broth is pretty much you, look at my pot. You throw bones into a pot. This is my stock pot. Um, these are turkey necks from last year's turkeys. Uh, if you, meat, grass-fed meat is expensive. Even bones for your stock are expensive. Um, they're $3 and up a pound sometimes. Um, but you can make friends with somebody who's butchering a bunch of chickens. They don't often save the necks and feet, right, Melissa, if you know some. They don't often save the necks and feet. So you can make friends with someone who raises and butchers chickens, turkeys, and grab the necks and feet. They make the most gelatinous, amazing broth. Um, also, you can find different places um, that will bulk sell bones for a lesser price sometimes. Um, the Royal Butcher, if you buy at least 30 pounds, I think they were $2 a pound, if you, but you had to buy more than 30 pounds, which is a good chunk in your freezer of space if you don't have it. Um, if you go to the Montpelier Co-op, Misty Knoll chicken backs are like $1.99 a pound. They still have a little meat on them in the freezer section. They're not always there, but um, that's not... I think Misty Knowles, Vermont um, grower. I don't think they're. I don't think they're just. They're just grass fed. They're probably pretty conventionally raised. I think they're pretty conventionally raised. But if it's meat stock or no meat stock, conventionally raised or not, go buy the conventionally raised bird and have your meat stock. Because sometimes we try to be so healthy that we miss out on some really good opportunities. Because again, it's steps. It's where we are today. And what are the little steps that I can go and take to, to do better, to make it better? So that's a, those are uh, just a few really inexpensive ways to acquire really like the best body healing food yeah another good place for bones is the roma butchery mm -hmm. oh, okay i haven't tried their tortillas before yeah. that's a good tip mm -hmm. excellent is midweek go midweek she was saying third wednesday okay okay good tip and then yeah. and if, you, if you if you specifically ask her for something she can help set it you out. aside yeah like set it aside for you brilliant brilliant thank you i might have to hit her up yeah good tips all around um, yeah, so there's a differentiation on your sheet there. Bone, um, so meat stock is basically a hunk of meat or a hunk of bone with meat on it. I have one in my fridge. I didn't bring it. These are just bones. They don't have the meat on them. Um, so what you want is a hunk of bone with a hunk of meat connected to it because where the meat connects to the bone is the most nutrient filled. You have all of the... Oh, what are those two connective tissue words? Collagen. You've got the collagen, you've got the starts, glycine um, that are the same building blocks in your own body. So we all, yeah, the collagen, the glycine, um, that 90% of our nervous system is in our guts. Over 80% of our immune system is made in our guts. Um, everything from Roundup to the processed food that we eat, everything that's not raised like this is wrecking havoc on our guts. And that's why we have so much mental and emotional illness. We have inflammation, we're sick. Um, and the number one good place to start is our guts. Um, and we all can do that. We all can start there. So the best, most healing thing you can do 
is meat stock. So you take your, your bone with meat attached to it, you throw it in a pot, you cover it with an inch, no more of water. You want to fit your bones puzzle pieces together so they're nice and tight in there um, with the meat on them. Throw about an inch of water over top, a tablespoon of salt, and then just cook it. Um, and meat stock is not cooked very long. The reason is because bone broth has a lot more intense nutrients, which is wonderful. But if your gut isn't ready to handle that, if it's too um, permeated, too inflamed, the villi aren't healthy, that's actually going to, bone broth is going to be aggravating to you. If you have histamine um, intolerance, then you're going to often get a reaction. So you're like, I'm drinking bone broth. Why am I reacting to this? Um, because bone broth is more intense um, to digest, even though it's extremely good for you. Um, so you want to start with the meat stock if you're really trying to heal your body for at least, well, several months or a year. Um, so start with that. And you can even just do meat stock and do like a meat stock fast um, for a day, for a week. Um, do meat stock with just then eating that boiled meat. You can add a little bit of black pepper. Uh, some people, if their stomachs are sensitive to black pepper, will actually put ground up black pepper in like a sachet and put it in. So you're not actually having the black pepper, but the properties in it will not only make your broth, your stock taste better, but it will actually spark, tell your body to start the digestion process. So I'll stop about the stock unless you have questions, but it's brilliant. Um, I eat a quart or drink a quart to a half a gallon a day um, because I have a lot to heal still, including a broken ankle. Um, so it's just really good. But it, I am one of those people that if I eat bone broth, then I actually spark a histamine reaction, which is not fun. Um, so some you can't be die hard. This is good for me. Well, if it's not good for you, there's probably a reason. So, so you don't cover the bones. You said just put a, a small amount of water, just an inch of water? No, I'll put an inch, I'm sorry, I'll put an inch of water, like, I would probably want a few more bones in this pot, but I'll cover, cover my oh, an bones with an bones. inch. Oh. Yep. And I actually often will leave, like these are still partially frozen, but I'll soak them overnight, mm -hmm. which I feel like just softens them up a little bit, and then go ahead and boil them. And then oftentimes, have y'all ever seen like the gray scum that rises to the top? Some people think that's the bones cleaning themselves. Um, I don't know. I just skim it off. Um, and then, so yeah, fish, you want to boil about an hour for stock. Um, fish, you want to boil about an hour. Chicken, two. You can even throw a whole chicken. That's like optimal. Just throw the whole chicken in a big pot. You need one a little bigger than this. And stainless steel um, is a lot. You don't want to be cooking in aluminum. Don't wreck your efforts with heavy metals. Um, and then beef is like up to four hours. And then bigger bones, I'll actually cheat and do it again because um, I'm thrifty. But uh, chicken bones, I'll usually boil once, sometimes twice. The bigger bones, and if I don't want to do it that day, I'll just throw the whole pot in my freezer. And make sure you can scoop out the, the bone marrow. That's like, that's like God's gift to man. It tastes a little funny. It's, do you not do bone marrow? Mm. Oh, no, I love it. Okay, that was the, that was, that's your food. My, when I was little, my grandmother used to, I was a really spoiled youngest grandchild and my grandmother it's like tradition to give the honored people the boat the bone marrow and I, I had my own little spoon I love that so <laughs> what was your grandmother's background that that was a Pakistani mm. Pakistani so a lot of goat brilliant yeah. yeah she mm -hmm. was the favorite grandchild <laughs> <laughs> now she's the robust grandchild because yeah. you got all that bone marrow it's brilliant it's it's like one of the best foods you can eat so good for you and so easily digestible um, to your gut. So that's stock. Any questions on stock? Yep. It's not exactly a question and I don't want to derail this too much, but a comment is that a barrier that I find with stock is like mm -hmm. getting rid of the stuff afterwards and processing it and then I'll have this situation where it goes rancid and it's just like an Like issue. the bones or? Or like 
I'll like Which leave part? it on the stove. And I guess this is my own fault. But I think that that's a real barrier for me is like even mm-hmm. afterwards, like or having a chicken that's like you have to pick off. And I was just wondering, what do people do with their bones? I have one creative thing I do, and that's like when the cook stove is going in the winter, I will burn the bones. But how okay. else, what else do people do with their bones after? I throw them off into the woods because I don't feed them to my dog. I, the cooked bones, mm. they break up into shards and then it's not good for my dog. I want to, but I don't. So I throw them off in the woods. I put them in the, just in the garden beds and stuff. I just in the garden beds? Threw them around, yeah. What's everybody Sometimes. else do with their bones? Compost pile. Compost pile. Yeah. They eventually break down. Yep, okay. Is that helpful? Yeah, I'm just Ideas. curious because I think for me that's often like a... Like, yeah, it's like I don't want to make it again. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Yeah, I feel like oftentimes there's those mental blocks because I have had them too. Like, oh, making this, it's like an I have to plan to be home all day. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and I've used my Instapot, but I don't love that idea. I just want to use a heavy stainless steel pot and boil it down the best way possible. Um, but I find that if I do it first thing in the morning, like if I get up at 5 30 and i'm not leaving the house till 8 well i just boiled the first batch and then i leave that on the stove all day uh uh-huh unrefrigerated Mm -hmm. and then in the evening it will be cooled off when i get back home i'll pour that off add more water and i can have another boil by bedtime so i don't know i think you find these routines eventually that work for you Mm-hmm. And then uh, if I don't want to boil it again, but I don't want to throw away my bones, I'll just put the whole pot in the freezer mm-hmm. or I'll just put them in a, like a bag and put them in the freezer mm-hmm. to use again. But, uh, oh, I have, good a, question. I, I have a question because in the past I've made, you know, with broth stock and everything and I've canned it in a pressure canner. Yes. And, uh, but then I, I did talk to one person who was some, like a sort of naturopath mm-hmm. person there and they were, very much against pressure cookers mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. I think they thought that it raised the food to like an unnatural mm-hmm. temperature. But yep. on the other hand, if you're roasting a chicken, it's like 450 degrees. Right. So you're eating that. And that's right. Okay. I mean, so I just didn't know if you had, you know, experimented with I've that. I've read that too that. about, you know, the negative sides of pressure canning. I don't pressure can. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just for, so convenient because then, right. you know, if I make a stock like that, yeah, you know, and but and you can water bath can. It just takes longer. But not if with you, the meat, not with the meat broth. It's supposedly, you know, not supposedly not good because it's a low acid. So product. how did? That's what they say. Um, but how did our ancestors can meat for so many years with just a water bath and no pressure can? Well, then they'll say yeah, and then this whole family died of broth. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, I, I know the scare tactics. No, 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 I'm well aware of that. I mean, no, my my husband's Italian, and and what was perfectly normal if they had a roast on yeah. a certain day. Okay, you had the roast, you had your whole meal, everyone yep. cut, cut their piece off. And, oh, there's half a roast left? You just stick it in the oven. Stick yep. it in the oven, close the door, and then yep. you come back and pull it out the next day, and it's fine. And yep. like, you know, it, that's mm-hmm. normal. We've yeah. gotten too yeah. heightened. Yeah. And yeah. really, yeah. I think a lot of it, and what I sometimes tell people that are like, but this blog said this. I'm like, yeah. bloggers are really awesome. I love <laughs> Google. Bloggers are cool, <laughs> yeah. but everybody has to have an answer yeah. for a problem for you for them to get traffic, which often means they have to inflate the problem in order to have the answer yeah, to get much, traffic. It's not so much from bloggers, so but it's like things like I went to like a NOFA conference and you know, they yeah. have, they have presentations sort of like yours, some of them. Yeah. But then they had this lady from the FAO, the FAO which is like this, right. and she's all into like how in Africa she's gonna get everybody to do like constant hand washing and have like refrigerated like stations for so mm-hmm. I was like, this is not, this is not possible. Like this is right. not, it's not, it doesn't combine with the way people actually yeah. live. I mean, Florence Nightingale, Nightingale did impose, amazing things you know. back in the day by bringing sanitation to like India yeah. and the battlefields, right? Yeah. So that, I mean, there is that, but then there's the common sense of, but did your Italian husband's head. family's yeah, meat yeah. kill them because they left no, it out? No, no, but there's this thing people no. say like, you can't, this can't be at less than 40 degrees for more than a half an hour. And you know, right. th- there's, this is programmed into I a always, lot of the I, food yeah. preparation I stuff. It is. in mind yeah, that yeah. dirt was, is a baby second food. <laughs> Yeah. That's good. That's good. I, I think know, you I'm have to said, figure out what yeah, you're comfortable yeah. with yeah, yeah. and go with that. And maybe if a friend comes along and says, well, yeah. 
I leave my that. roast out all night and then eat it the next day and yeah. no one's died. <laughs> then yeah. they can br- like no. maybe sometimes then change your comfort level. Again, is basically what's going to happen. They'll just like, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think away. you just have to <laughs> beware of the yeah. messaging you're taking in. Yeah, yeah. Be conscious of your comfort level. Yeah. yeah. And rub shoulders with people that haven't died yet. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. That's the, that's the yeah. formula. Oh, but I don't just know. sort of back to trust your nose. Yes. That's a very good one. Yeah. I do that with bone broth um, or meat stock. So when there's this beautiful fat seal, mm. oh, I can leave this in the fridge mm. for a yeah. month and yeah. it's fine, yeah. um, which seems like a really long time mm-hmm. because they say you can tell it's, it's like that. a week, 10 days, but yeah. oh, you can smell yeah. the bone broth. <laughs> if you've smelled it, you're yeah, shaking yeah. your head. Yeah. It's bad. Um, so you throw it away. Yeah. Thank you, Jess. Your yeah. nose, yeah. your eyes. like. So back to the pressure camp, yep. just the higher temperature. I don't you know. Don't I've read both. I don't, okay. I don't, I oh, don't, okay. I mean, I've read the same. Yeah. I don't, okay. I don't know for a fact. I don't pressure can. Mm-hmm. I don't really can much at all. Mm-hmm. But I would imagine if you've already heated up and cooked it, I don't know. What's anybody else think about pressure canning? Melissa, you're the guru. You're always going to turn to it. I just get it boiling hot and throwing the and seal mm-hmm. Me too. That's all I do as okay, well. So with meat And that's what we've always done, like my whole life, and we're all still here. (laughs) And I rarely wash my cast iron pan, too. Um, Yeah, so, and I'll leave this out overnight, cooling on the stove, so that I'm putting away cool stock or broth into my fridge. So, sorry, is this too late? Should we keep going? We're good? Okay. I knew this was a lot to cover, but I thought it would, you know, go a little quicker, but we're all good. What's to come is not much. Um, so then the difference with bone broth. So bone broth is, has a lot more collagen. It's a lot more gelatinous. So this you can tell is stock. Uh, it's a lot runnier. Partly it's room temperature, but this came out of the fridge like this. If this was bone broth, nice collagen rich bone broth, I wouldn't be able to do this. It'd be like jello in there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And the more chicken feet you boil, or calves' heads, or um, calves' feet, the more gelatinous you're going to have. So that's amazing for your bones, your skin, your hair. There's really, there's more of a mineral and amino acid profile in bone broth than any other food you could eat. It's really just, it'll heal you. If you can tolerate bone broth, it will heal you and keep you healthy and strong. Um, There's some people that I know that just purposely... They're healthy, wealthy, and wise, and they still purposely drink at least a cup of bone broth every day, just because. If you don't want to, I like to just drink it, sip it, especially in the wintertime. The stock, I'm I'm going back to stock, but you can do either or. Um, You can add ginger. You can, I love it. Like you add a little bit of ginger. Yeah. What did you say is the difference between the broth and the stock? Yep. Hmm. So broth is predominantly bones boiled for at least 16 hours up to 48 hours and there's just a lot stronger mineral and amino acid um, density there's a lot more collagen it's a lot more gelatinous because it has the bro- the bones have broken down a lot and it's just so much more nutrients but if someone has a sick gut they can't or histamine intolerance of any type they can't always handle the bone broth, and you can tell, like if it gives you digestive systems, symptoms, or you know, if your face flushes or you don't feel well, or you, you know, break out with a rash, it's probably best to go back to stock. So the stock is really vegetables, is that it? So nope, the stock is meaty bones boiled for a shorter time. Oh. Yeah, but you can add, you can add vegetables and herbs for flavoring. All right, so stock and broth are the same thing, really. They're it's cooked two different lengths of time. Yeah, just the timing and is different. And stock is meaty bones, like meat. bones with meat on them, and bone broth is, you can do meaty bones, but it's more just bones. Oh, okay. Yep. I and think, then I think boil the a, longer I think time. A, if you went to like a culinary school, they probably would say broth is when it's not filtered and strained, and like a stock okay. is when... Yeah. They put it through all these filters, so it comes out perfectly clear. So I'm just talking traditionally, right? Right. Yeah. But I think they have a, they come out, They would have different from color definitions exactly. for those. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you'll usually wait 
till the next day, and it's a clear. Oh, so it'll yes, yes that like, is, almost like consomme, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're right. There's nothing ever clear oh, about mine, <laughs> <laughs> which I think is a good thing. No, right. It's sort of like the uh, it's yep. like, you know the beer that's not filtered and some of those things. Yeah. You feel like there's good stuff in that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm still going to filter my syrup, though. <laughs> um, so one thing when I'm making stock, I like to add stuff to it. Um, but you can also, I mean, if you eat anything that you use water to cook, you can use bone broth instead. So put bone broth in your mashed potatoes. Put bone broth in your rice. Put bone broth in your anything. Bone broth has a stronger flavor, especially if it's beef than stock does so if you don't want that beefy flavor make your cream of wheat with with meat stock whatever like you can get that added nutrients by cooking with your stock or broth even if you don't just like soup i don't like soup so oftentimes i'll have what a deconstructed soup so i'll have like i'll drink my broth out of a, a coffee mug and then i'll eat the meat that i've picked out of the broth go figure we're all different right <laughs> if you like soup down the hatch um, but again you can be so creative to just bolster the nutrients in so many different ways easily once you just get creative with the techniques and then you're like this is so easy why haven't I always done this um, another thing is I'll add stuff to my bones when they're cooking so this is chaga I got this off a tree and I'll actually reuse these pieces like for a month <laughs> I don't know how anybody familiar with chaga like how often you can you reuse the pieces like we keep one in the tea kettle and just let it go. Oh, that's oh, brilliant. Yeah. So you just yeah. add water. You just literally keep yeah, it in the tea kettle. I just keep it. I love that. Yeah. See, that's, that's a great, great tip. Yeah. It's, a yeah. Okay. it's great for immune boosting, particularly. Um, it helps cut down on bacteria, unfriendly growth in your body. What else? What else is supposed to be a good cancer fighter. Really good cancer fighter. Really good immune yeah. really That's something they recommend if you have Lyme disease. Yes. Tastes like uh, really nice. Tastes oh, I never noticed that. Yeah. Maybe it's usually hiding behind meat. But I like that. <laughs> Tastes like what? Vanilla. Oh, oh, no. Yeah. Mm. Brilliant. Brilliant. So I'll do that. Um, I tuck these over in the corner. Does anybody know what these are? If I put a big sign that says don't touch. These are nettles. Oh, wow. These grow prolifically in my yard. I have this little idea that uh, what you need grows around you. Um, I first learned that from Steven Buhner. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of him. He uh, wasn't a doctor, but he was like a bio something researcher that is basically the king of putting all the available Lyme disease research together. He loved plants. He loved the earth. And he had this idea that with the rise of Lyme disease came the rise of Japanese knotweed around here. And that's what is pro most prominent in addressing Lyme. So I always thought that was a neat idea. So I look around. So in one patch, I have a huge whole bunch of nettles. And then right here, I have a huge whole bunch of jewelweed, which if you're familiar with jewelweed, has those pretty orange flowers. If you get stung with nettles or bee, wasp, any poison ivy, you just take that, I chew it up, and then you spit it on yourself. And uh, it takes the sting out like miraculously. So anyways, I figure I have a lot of this growing in my yard. I should probably eat it. Um, and so you can cook it down like spinach. It's so tasty and good. Just don't touch it um, because it will sting you. So I always use gloves. Um, it's beautiful. It's one of the first greens that comes out in the springtime. It's so much of it. It's good for your eyesight. I think it has a lot of vitamin A in it, right? It's a lot of minerals in it. Exactly. And this, yep. it's good for tea. Very good for tea. You can have nettle tea, you can dry it, make nettle tea. I, again, I'm too lazy to make tea. So, <laughs> so I'm like, how many properties can I combine in the same pot, right? So I just throw the nettles in the pot in like the last half hour of cooking. And then I just scoop them out and throw them away. Um, but when I, yeah, when you put, this doesn't have chaga in it. If you're familiar with chaga, this would be a beautiful dark, dark brown color. Um, and the nettles make it a little bit darker too. So I actually didn't add anything to this because I forgot. Um, but you can add, again, I usually always add peppercorns. It just tastes really good. You can add ginger, makes a really nice sipping broth in the wintertime. If you add ginger with a little maple syrup, that's even more delicious. It's just so tasty and it's, it just 
boosts, it does. I was trying to think of a good word. It just makes you vigorous. It makes you feel alive. You ever eat food and you're just like, boom, you know? Okay, broth is one of those. Steak, yes, yes. My kefir and egg yolks is one of those. She's like, just turn the lights on. Um, you can add onions, carrots. I brought this just because I didn't want to cut it up and feed it to you because it's too big. But I was like, dang, that's a big carrot. Um, so garlic, onions, um, add anything to your broth um, and then use it in everything. If you take one thing away tonight, just start making broth all the time with everything and drink it. Um, and then just one other thing is I think that we make the most beautiful nourishing food when we're surrounded by beautiful things. And so I love this little copper bowl that lives on my counter and holds my garlic and onions that I grew myself. Like I love I just love pretty things. You know, I keep my, my stuff that I use all the time in jars on the counter. Here's my peppercorns, here's my chaga. So things don't always have to be tucked away. They can be out and pretty, you know, flowers on the, on the counter, a bowl of eggs, just something that makes you want to grab and use, even if it's simple. Like you're, I brought this pound of meat just because it seemed like I couldn't show you the things to eat without showing you some local grass-fed beef. And I did put some ideas for recipes because it doesn't have to be hard. I mean, I wasn't sure who was coming tonight. You all are pretty well versed, it seems like, in all of this information. You know what to use, how to use it, and where to find it. Um, you could probably teach me a lot of things. Some people don't, and it seems so hard and complicating. There's the other idea, a false notion that we need variety in our diet. Who came up with that? <laughs> um, we eat seasonally, and like you can eat the same five things mm -hmm. all year round and be healthier than your neighbor who mm -hmm. has to eat variety because it's good for their gut or good for something. I don't know what it's good for, but you don't need variety. <laughs> And uh, if you're a lazy cook like me, it just gives you more headspace to be like, just eat the yeah. same stuff. Yeah. And if you get tired of that, rotate something new in. It just, it, 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 I think there's also a social thing. It's almost like when I was growing up, yeah. you know, to go to school, you would have to have a new outfit every day. Oh God! You know, but but because you just would. I mean, so That's you would change. Point. You know, like because because you wouldn't just wear the same dress that you wore the day right, before. Right. You know, it would just. And so that I think that that kind of spills over <laughs> into, well, we're going to have you know this on this day, this and yeah. this, and then it, like it's part of the sort of panoply that you're supposed to yeah. orchestrate to have this big symphony. Well, let's all together get together and instead of just eat, simply. Yeah. 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 That will be our no, now, no, now I wear the same thing. I just have this outfit that I wear the same, I wear the same thing all week yeah. practically. So yeah. that's, that's, I, you know, I've, I've gotten we grow up into that. what works for us, yeah. right? Yeah. And clears out our yeah. headspace. Yeah. Yeah. Um, How about fasting? Do you employ fasting at all? With Do I personally? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I never liked to eat breakfast, even as a kid, and eventually intermittent fasting just caught up with what I like to do anyway, yeah. so mm -hmm. that's cool. Um, I think fasting is very individual. Mm -hmm. uh, I think when you're healing, it's incredibly healthy and beneficial for you. Um, if for no other reason, we store a lot of toxins and sickness in our fat, and so fasting relieves your digestive system, gives it a, the best break to heal and repair. Um, your body will switch into using fat, so you'll lose fat, which sometimes you can go into a healing reaction because your body can't process that much fat toxins um, quick enough, so you got to be careful of that. Uh, I think it'd be, be so good for you. Almost every culture has, has included some kind of fasting, um, so I think it'd be very good for you, but I also think it's very individualistic. Like If you are already malnourished, even if you're 50 pounds overweight, you can still be malnourished and you can't, you know, you need those nutrients um, to rebuild your body. If you're trying to grow a little human, you know, you need those nutrients to build your body. If you're, you know, have way too much trouble with blood sugar, it might be best to go on like a healthier diet, a better diet to kind of address some of those blood sugar imbalances and then try and incorporate um, fasting. I think some people, and some people are just different. Um, I don't know if that's a helpful answer, but that's my perspective. Yeah, I was just wondering what you thought about. What's anybody else think about fasting? Oh, oh no. I, I just don't like to eat unless I'm hungry. 
Mm. There you and go. <laughs> most, most people eat whether they're hungry or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I just don't like to do that. So mm -hmm. I'm just like, hey, use your hunger as a guide. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And they're usually not hungry, like you say. In yeah. the morning, you might not be hungry at all until noon. So you don't so, eat. Fine. Yeah. yeah. I'm cool with well, that. Well, I think also, yeah. you know, things like you know, juice fasts or, or just mm -hmm. broth fasts, things mm -hmm. like that are kind of a, you know, halfway yep. point where yep. you're, you're, you're not taxing your body to have to mm. do all the digestion of your mm -hmm. carrots and stuff. It's, it's kind of all, almost pre-digested. Yep. So it might get people... I'd say the juice fast, that's a pretty heavy concentrated mm -hmm. sugar hit. Oh, that's, well, that's true. But people so, talk about juicing. I mean, yeah. some people, mm -hmm. that might be a good thing for mm -hmm. a little while, mm -hmm. but I think maybe not yeah. for... Yeah. I, I try, I can't handle that much sugar. But mm -hmm. for some mm -hmm. people, especially if you're mm -hmm. eliminating a lot of things, maybe mm -hmm. um, it can be helpful. Mm -hmm. But... Yeah. Any other thoughts on fasting, nutrition, health, anything? This was awesome. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you. you. I yeah, feel like I great. should apologize that it was so long. <laughs> I'm like, maybe I should have broken up some of these things. Yeah, I, I guess I have um, one but, sort of comment about a lot of these things because there are things that I've just, I've investigated a little bit here, a little bit sure. here. Sure. But I've never really been able to take them on, maybe sort of like some of the things Jess is saying, just logistically, kind yep, of, yep. to really get into the rhythm that they require, or just the change, the shift of, of in perception. And also, yeah. you're surrounded by people who are just eating warmer. Right, right. A lot right. of times. So you're a little so bit like the whole buffalo now. herd is headed over the yeah. cliff, yeah. Yeah. And, and you're the pizza. one trying to go and this up. way. And, right. uh, yeah, and yeah. So, and so that's a, that's just yep. sort of a social, you know, struggle to some extent. Yeah, which is a beautiful thing, and I want to, like I always say, I wanted this more often. Mm -hmm. so we can rub shoulders with people doing the same thing. Be yeah. like, well, how do you do that? Yeah. What's it look like in because your kitchen? that becomes the, the normal thing. Yeah, this is our normal. And the other people are doing the weird things. Yeah, mm. we're not weird. <laughs> <laughs> we're like on target with nature and how we were created to be. Yeah, exactly. yeah this is a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, is that Celtic sea salt or is that Redmond's? Oh, this is Redmond's. Okay. It's a little cheaper than Celtic. Okay. Yes, thank you. So, you know, we've been told a lot of things. Don't eat salt um, yeah. is one of them. But table salt, don't eat it. Don't eat table salt. They, mm. um, it has dextrose in it. It's what? They, has dex they add dextrose in it. Dextrose? Yeah, Do they? Really? I didn't know they add dextrose Is that the, the anti-caking ingredient or something? I don't know. It's, it's just sugar. It's but sugar. it's so refined, it only has like two minerals in it. Mm. And it's legitimately not good for you. This uh -huh. has like 70-something minerals, mm. trace minerals in it. This is really good for you. Eat more salt. Mm. Um, yeah, but needs... some people refer to mineral salt. We mm. need salt. We, we need, need salt. salt. Yeah. Desperately. Right. Desperately. Right. We are made up of salt. And what they've done a long time ago, I always yeah. said, uh -huh. years yeah. ago, yeah. what they've done, more than salt or whatever, mm. what they've done is take off all the mm. good qualities of that mm. stuff and mm. give it to the masses mm. and then sell them. And after you go to the doctor and say, oh, yeah, yeah, then you get this. What happens when you go to the doctor and you feel dehydrated, not good? Mm. Saline solution, honey. That's oh, salt. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah. They tell you not to eat salt, and then when you're really having a hard time, they well, give you salt. Well, even these things like Gatorade, like you see all these young people oh, eating, drinking yeah. the Gatorade all the time. I mean, it's because you need those. You need no, those electrolytes. Yeah. But but yep. they did, but they sell you. But well, you need these version. electrolytes. Yeah. And that company actually yeah. makes an electrolyte. Yeah, oh, re Relight. Yeah. Relight, I think it's called. It has stevia in it, so there's no even sugar in it. It has yeah. a nice mix of potassium. Well, I came across a, a, a guy yeah. who used this phrase: "They steal the real and sell you back the fake." Oh, I like that. that. <laughs> and it's kind of like, like you can that. really see that. That's yep. pharmacia. Yeah. What is that? Yeah. Look it up. Pharmacia. It's nothing more than selling you mm -hmm. something that mm -hmm. what you're saying, mm -hmm. nature is providing for yeah. us right there at the doorstep. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they've taken that away. I mean, that yeah. is a mm -hmm. long time happening yeah. with Rockefeller way back in the 20s. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. When he, when he took away yeah. the real naturopath the homeopathy the, the naturopath the, they, yeah, they the herbalist they literally even in the last few years have done some of these people in yeah. because they're afraid of them speaking out yeah it's so scary you know we have yeah. to literally do what we're doing and it's like underground yeah. Yeah. Wait, did you all turn off your phones before you came here <laughs> they're not listening right <laughs> No, it's true. It's like wake up, wake yeah, up, exactly. yeah. and look backwards. Yeah. What have we always done? What has kept us healthy? Mm -hmm. It's crazy to me always that like the things that are pushed 
are what are causing mm -hmm. our health care, health care mm -hmm. crisis. Mm -hmm. And then we have a health care crisis. We can't pay for it. But the dietary recommendations are causing mm -hmm. that. And it's sad, particularly for our children. I'm most sad for our children because mm -hmm. they don't have a choice until yeah. they get to be so old. Mm -hmm. And then they have to figure out how to redo all the damage that mm -hmm. we caused. You know, and this came to me because lately they were talking about the um, the school lunches, like universal. Oh, okay. every, everyone's like, a, you know, good thinking person. Well, of course we don't want our kids to go hungry. But I remember over the summer, I we lived near the pool, the rec center in Randolph. They were handing out what they were handing out is lunchables. Mm -hmm. Oh God, that's you know. So I mean, it's yes, it's great that your kids are getting free food, but. Yep. Yeah. Maybe a peanut butter sandwich would have been better. Would be better Bye, right? Jess. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Yeah. Take care. Great. Bye. See you later. Sorry, it's so late. <laughs> but yeah, if you all want to try the sauerkraut, try the cheese, try this. There's little sample cups here if you want to try my beautiful vinegar.